A lot of us are all too familiar with what social media has done to journalism, politics, public policy, like how to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. But there's a terrific new book out on what social media and the internet have done to history. It is by Jason Steinhauser. He's an author, global fellow at the Wilson Center. The name of his book is History Disrupted, How Social Media and the World Wide Web Have Changed the Past. This book has become a number one bestseller on Amazon rave reviews, and this is an academic book, which makes it even more amazing. Jason, good of you to join us. First of all, what prompted you to do this book? Well, actually, it's exactly what you just said. There have been so many studies and conversations about how social media has affected our politics, affected journalism, affected public health, but no one had really looked at or analyzed how social media and the web have changed history and changed what we know about the past. And so. The more I looked into it, the more I realized that there was an important book here to write. And it sounds like the more you looked into it, the more troubling it became. Yeah, one of the things I learned as I researched this book is that even though we have so much history in the public domain on social media and in the news media and on the web, it actually isn't improving our understanding of history all that much. In fact, what it's doing, I argue in the book, is just embedding the values of the social web deeper into our lives. So that would tend to a lot of people to suggest that things become much more abbreviated, simplified, uh, and perhaps um, things that are false conspiracy theories then get embedded and become a place where people can go and say, aha, well, of course, Pearl Harbor was a false flag because I found it here on the web. Yeah, the book does talk about misinformation and disinformation. That's an aspect of the book, but the book is really set up to be this contrast in values. And one of the things I write in the book is that history is uh, the professional discipline of history, the practice of history is a is a very time consuming, labor intensive, always evolving intellectual endeavor. And so to communicate history online involves taking that endeavor and transposing it into a social web, which promises to be instantly gratifying to give you answers right away, which is largely user centric as opposed to expert centric. And so this creates a lot of challenges for communicating history, particularly professional history. And as I argue in the book, what it does is it ultimately changes what we think about history because it shifts it from being something that is expert centric to user centric, something that is always evolving to something that is instantly gratifying. And that is one of the outcomes of all this that I think has been understudied and underappreciated. A lot of us who are familiar with the academic world understand that there's a certain peer review process. And if you publish a book in political science or history, there are other history experts who are there to weigh in on the strengths and weaknesses of the argument. But it sounds like in this particular case now, well, that is sort of being torn apart. Yeah, and listen, I'm not a nostalgic for the old days of academia where only people like me were allowed to participate in the creation of new knowledge. I think some of the gatekeeping has rightfully come down and allowed more diverse voices into the conversation. But on the flip side of that, those mechanisms also allow nefarious actors and people with you know, maybe not the most honest agendas to introduce historical narratives into the conversation and to crowdsource them into becoming popularized and to becoming accepted. And I talk about this in the book that you know, crowdsourcing has its positives, but it also has its negatives. And there are many aspects and many instances where far right nationalist groups or disinformation agents have crowdsourced history into the public sphere. And it's sort of taken on a life of its own and become accepted as truth. That shape of history and given the crowdsourcing and far right groups that you mentioned, is it predominantly or is it clearly involving say memories of fascism or Nazism in World War II and sort of what was happening then and what people understand it now? You know, it's really interesting because the more I looked at this, the more I saw these patterns happening across platforms and across different subject matters. So it's not just one or two issues that maybe stand out at the top of our minds, right? This is a repeated mechanism by which hostile actors or people with nefarious agendas crowdsource information on various platforms about history and then eventually it bubbles up into our news feeds. And because it's resting alongside all this other information by academics and journalists and others, it's really hard for the average consumer to distinguish one from the other. And so it it ends up being much more confusing than anything else, which is why I argue at the end of the book that actually we're not really improving our understanding of history at all through this environment. In fact, we may be even making it worse. Jason, give us one of your favorite examples from the book in terms of this stuff bubbling up into the mainstream, into news feeds that was essentially crowdsourced and maybe incorrect. Well, one of the things I talk about in the books, I talk about Wikipedia and I talk about the crowdsource pass and how that works. And what was interesting about Wikipedia is I actually found an example where crowdsourcing actually prevented 
truthful information or accurate information from entering the public sphere. There was a historian who was an expert on the Haymarket riot in 1886 in Chicago. And he tried to update the Wikipedia page to include his scholarship and the crowd told him no, he couldn't update it because his singular voice should not overrule the voice of the crowd. So we oftentimes think about crowdsourcing and the way that it bubbles up information into our feeds, but also crowdsourcing can have the opposite effect. It can keep factual information from ever reaching our eyes. That was kind of a surprising story for me. And I think it's not something we always think about when we think about these mechanisms that the web has engendered. So what did this historian about the Haymarket riot in 1896, what did he, what did he do to, to deal with this? Well, he actually tried three times to update his Wikipedia page, the the Wikipedia page, and was rejected all three times under the same logic. And eventually, he wrote an op-ed about this, which was published, uh, I believe, in the Chronicle of Higher Education or Inside Higher Ed. And eventually, over time, I think he was able to make improvements to the page as his scholarship became more widely known and widely accepted. But it sort of points to this idea of how the crowdsourcing mechanisms can have positive effects, but they can also have negative effects. They can raise disinformation to our eyes, but they can also prevent factual information from ever reaching our eyes. I also wonder if it gets to in the world of political science, um, there's this whole sort of uh, theory that, well, you know, things happen not just because of individual actors, but because of institutions and culture. And yet on the internet, social media is so much sort of celebrity driven, it's individual driven. And to me, it suggests that maybe that as people are sort of changing history, they're looking more at the celebrities in history and discounting some of the things that in the past have been crucial in terms of institutional factors that weigh in and contribute to how history is shaped. Yeah, what's interesting is one of the things I look at in the book is I look at the incentives for creating content online and how those incentives create and reward different types of historical information, right? And one of the incentives I take a hard look at is this incentive of virality. The ability to send something viral through networks and how we reward that with fame, with attention, with money, with book contracts. And what that does in the case of history is it incentivizes people to find ways to send history content viral through networks, even if that content isn't accurate. And I look at the example of history and pics, which is this viral history account that has about 4 million followers on Twitter. And basically what they did is they devised a formula to send history content viral through networks. And that virality got them fame and attention and public acclaim, got them written up in all kinds of media organizations. But there was a lot of problems with the accuracy of that account. And meanwhile, to your point, as you're saying, you know, there are scholars and academics who are doing laborious work in the archives and producing historical content every year that is accurate and fact-based and rigorously researched. And that content never sees the light of day because the incentives on social media don't reward it. There's been an argument from the crowdsourcing groups that uh, historians have tended to be biased, have tended to be of a certain uh, gender and racial persuasion. And therefore, maybe it's a good thing that there's more crowdsourcing in terms of understanding history. What's the what's the response? Well, listen, I think diversity is crucial to telling a story of the past, whether it be the American past or any past. And so the more voices and the more diverse voices that can be at the table in a production of historical knowledge, I think that's a good thing. And I appreciate the calls for diversity. And I think it's great that the history profession is looking less and less like me and more and more like a diverse group of people that this country represents. On the flip side of that, what you get though, is you get this distrust in institutions that you've talked about. And throughout the book, I did a lot of research and heard from a lot of people about how people do not trust academia. They do not trust traditional historical institutions. And a lot of that has been engendered by the web. So we have to find a balance where we can still have trust in our institutions and trust in those who do this type of evidence-based research that is time consuming and laborious to produce. And that produces what we believe to be accurate representations of the past while still making the seat at the table big enough so that everyone can participate in the process and lots of diverse voices can be heard. So given the challenges now, what is the answer? What is the solution to finding that balance in order to both protect the more voices who wanna be part of you know, the, the narration of history, but also protecting the academic rigor and expertise of people who are doing the laborious work? Yeah, well, these are really challenging questions that I grapple with in the book. I don't have all the answers, but one of my suggestions is I've actually created something called the History Communication Institute. And I envision this institute being a forum where we can have these types of conversations and bring diverse stakeholders to the table to confront these issues. Because there are a lot of headwinds facing professional history. As you've probably heard, 
history enrollments have been plummeting, people taking history classes have been plummeting, historians jobs are being cut left and right. And a lot of that has been engendered by the web and the forces that the web has unleashed. So what I wanna do through the History Communication Institute is use the ideas in the book as a leaping off point to talk about how we can diversify the stories and the profession and also adapt to the changing communications environment that we're in. Even though fewer people are supposed are taking history classes, it does seem there's something here given just how successful your book has been. I mean, people care about history. Were you surprised by the response and, and what do you attribute it to? Other than great writing and great research and all that that you've done, but just the, the, the genre seems to really grab people. Well, I think that this book touches on a number of subjects that people care about. It touches on social media and the web, which obviously is playing a huge role in our lives. It's touching on politics and activism and disinformation, all of which are crucial issues right now. And to your point, I think there are actually a lot of people who care about history and find history interesting. They maybe just haven't enjoyed the way history has been taught or communicated in the past, which is some of the reason why this e-history online succeeds. So I think my book has touched into a touched into a lot of these things. And maybe this can be the beginning of a new phase in history communication that gets more people excited about studying the past. Well, the reviews are simply a terrific. A history disrupted how social media and the World Wide Web have changed the past. It was written by Jason Steinhauser, an author and global fellow at the Wilson Center. Jason, thanks for doing this. We appreciate it and good to have you on. Thank you guys so much for having me. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.